So first, thank you all for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come present on this organization that's really close to my heart. Um, I'll give you a little backstory about me very quickly so that you understand, like, I feel like I'm amongst my people. Um, by default, I'm a techie. I, I worked for a long time, CS major, University of Missouri, got out of school, went into sales, did a little bit of healthcare, and then went into healthcare tech. So I used to build hospital information systems and bi-directional interfaces with like Quest and LabCorp and finally worked for a middleware company called Atlas. And so um, healthcare was my lane. Um, in 2009, I saw the opportunity to start my own firm to do some of the same consulting work that I was doing for the healthcare industry. Of course, how all things go, while I'm trying to get doctors to see the utility in having a qualified medical record system, they said, can you also build my website? <laughs> and I said, yes, because I like the revenue that it brought in. And so we started doing website development and mobile application design. And it went from not just doing websites and mobile apps for the healthcare companies that they owned. It also would be like Dr. Reddy, who also owned a Boston's pizza company in Tinley Park. Well, I built that too. Um, and that company grew. Uh, and I was able to run that company for 10 years. Um, after doing that, and, uh, about the end of 2019, 2018, uh, I was really frustrated in what I was seeing in the field. I would go to whether it was Content Marketing World or Inbound or Dreamforce, all these conferences, and I saw a lack of diversity. I saw a lack of people of color. I saw a lack of women. And my goal was trying to come back to Chicago and build an organization to change that. So I was teaching at UIC, teaching entrepreneurship and youth leadership, and I got a phone call from a friend who is CEO of Chicago Scholars. And she said, Jeff, we just got $4 million from an organization and we're going to be embarking on a, a new strategic plan to add career and leadership development for kids. She's like, do you think this is something that you'd want to do? Um, at the time, I was working, doing digital marketing work still, and I was like, well, I don't know. I've never written curriculum. I've never, I'm not in education. I don't teach naturally. I can teach tech because I, you know, let's roll out some code, I'm good. But I had the opportunity to come and work with our scholars, which um, has been really the most rewarding work I've ever done. Chicago Scholars recently was selected by LeBron James in the All-Star Game. I don't know if anybody, did anybody actually watch the All-Star Game in the room? A couple people? Good. So you might have noticed at the end of the game, there was a bunch of kids that ran onto the court with these blue Team LeBron shirts on. Well, those were actually Chicago Scholars. Uh, we still don't know exactly why he chose our organization, but he did come to Chicago and the NBA did as well prior to, and they got to pick an organization that they wanted to sponsor. And so what that meant was they changed the format of the All-Star Game this year. Each quarter was worth $100,000, with the fourth quarter being worth $300,000. So all in, a nonprofit organization had the opportunity to win up to $500,000. The team across the aisle was After School Matters. They are supremely much, much bigger than we are. So it was really like, you know, uh, a, a, a David and Goliath in this work. But our organization won on a free throw shot by Anthony Davis, who's a player for the Los Angeles Lakers, who actually happens to be a student from Chicago who went to Perspective High School. He, hit, he missed the first one, and he keeps telling people that he missed that one on purpose. And if you could have seen all 200 kids we had and all of our mentors and volunteers that were there at the game, we're literally shaking as he hits the free throw, the second one. But it won a lot of more money for our organization, which we're using towards developing a portal for our scholars to connect and better engage with what we do. Now, what do we do exactly? I'll give you some backstory on exactly what we do. Chicago Scholars was founded 20 years ago. Initially, it was founded under the premise that college access can really change the paradigm of communities, right? If you get to school, you get the degree, you go home, you're going to be successful. Well, that's actually not the case, in particular for black and brown people in the country. When you look at all the measurable indicators of what we should see from having the fact that the college graduation rates for those two particular groups of people have doubled in the last 20 years, all the measurable indicators of success are actually flat or going in the reverse trend. The number of black and brown CEOs in the country is flat. The number of Fortune 500 board seats have been at 15% the last 10 years. The amount of wealth being created in those families, in those communities, the median net income for a black family of four is about $6,800. For the Latinx family, it's $1,100. While when you look in the white community, it's $118,000. And if those trends continue by 2044, you'll actually see a negative net wealth for black and brown families in the country. 
That's not just bad for one particular group, that's bad for all of us, every business owner, the city of Chicago. And so what Chicago Scholars does, and recognizing that college access alone is not enough, is that we've invested not only in the college access phase of the work, but also providing students career and leadership development at their earliest levels to get to college, through college, into their career, and most importantly, to come back and be the leaders and organizations that we need to change some of the things happening in the city. Mission and vision, I won't read it to you, but it's a lot of what I just said. I'll share a story. So when I went to school, I was the first in my family, first male in my family to go to college. I went to the University of Missouri, as I mentioned, and I got out of school. I was a good academic performer. I had an internship all four years at International Truck and Engine Corporation, and I decided that I wanted to go into sales. Don't ask me why. I got a CS degree, and I wanted to go into sales. Somebody told me that you can make a lot of money in sales. They did not tell me about the stress and the quotas and losing all my hair in the first four years of getting out of school. <laughs> but I went to go work for Santa Via Fentis Pharmaceuticals. I sold Keytech, Allegra, and Nasacort AQ. And what's funny is about that, to this day, I still can tell you that Keytech is an antibiotic that helps fight sinusitis, bronchitis, and community-acquired pneumonia. <laughs> that was 2005, and that was drilled in my brain at this level that I still remember that. But what I learned in that role also was that it wasn't the fact that I was good at selling. I was a really good salesperson. I presented well, I got along with the doctors, I did what I needed to do, but I never got promoted. I didn't know that, you know, it wasn't the fact that you need to be able to sell, you also need to be able to market yourself, the personal branding aspects of it, the networking and building relationships. Because I was the first person to go into college in my family, I also was the first person in my family to work in this corporate environment. I didn't have a mentor to tell and kind of help guide me through navigating that when we went to Las Vegas for corporate retreats, that while I went back to the room to read and everyone else was downstairs at the craft table having fun and building relationships, that I needed to be down there too. Didn't know it. I thought, I'm going to prove them wrong. You guys go have all that fun. I'm going to go read this study on pneumonia and I'm going I'm to show you. But then what happened? As things happened annually, annual reports came out, my, my annual reviews were good but the people around me who had similar numbers but had relationships got promoted. And so we recognize as Chicago scholars that it's, it's not just college that matters. Who are our scholars? Chicago scholars are first generation college going students, similar students to the story that I just shared. They're from under-resourced communities. They're academically ambitious. What that means is that they've shown high aptitude or a trajectory. The average GPA for our high school juniors, which is the class that applies, is 3.6. We work with, every year, we take 700 students into our program at the end of their junior year. They stay with us through their entire senior year. They provided college counseling and mentorship. And these young people are high academic performers. But they also have to demonstrate leadership. And we don't use leadership at the lowest level of, you know, the authoritarian leadership, the level one leadership, like John Max C. Maxwell says. We believe that leadership is influence, but influence to achieve a common goal, a purpose, and working in tandem with others. So what that means is that our scholars, some of whom are taking care of their brother and sister at home and working full-time jobs, and also head of the debate team, or on the basketball team, those are our young leaders. And we pull that out. Every year, over 1,500 kids from CPS and the city of Chicago apply to be Chicago scholars. Over the next two months, starting March 1st, we'll interview 1,000 of those kids on 19 different nights, which we'll talk about. You all can come volunteer and take part in that and we'll select 700. And these are some of the brightest and most talented young people that you'll ever meet in the city. We've split our work up in really three phases, what we call college access, college support, career and leadership development. We talk about it in terms internally as launch, to take off, lift, to maintain through, and then lead, building leadership skills. And so when kids come into the program in that first year, they're provided a mentor and a counselor, as I mentioned before. The mentors are individuals like you, people who want to come and share that unique leadership story, how you got to where you got, the success story, some of the bumps you had in the road along your journey. Counselors are actually paid members of our team. And on average, a CPS student might get an hour of college counseling. Through Chicago Scholars, they get at least 13 hours of college counseling over that year. Students over the summer after they're admitted in that junior year will work all summer this summer to actually pick out their schools, identify what they want to do for their careers, and then they'll begin applying. 
And in October, we hold an event at Navy Pier called Onsite, where we bring all 700 of our scholars in, another 300 students from the community, and 200 plus colleges and universities to have a day where kids are actually admitted. Last year, 1,500 uh, admissions were given out and $43 million in merit aid was handed out to scholars. And so kids in October are getting in. Now, if you think about that in context, a lot of other students don't even begin that process in October, yet the kids that are part of our program are already admitted to school. So then you ask, well, what do they do the rest of the year? The rest of that year, November through the end of the year, is all leadership development. So we have a capstone program. I was part of New Leaders Council and uh, the Impact Program and Startup Grind and a few others, and in all of them, there was always a capstone. So when I came to Chicago Scholars and I was head of career and leadership development, I made sure that kids have to now do a capstone. But it's a social impact capstone. So they're building solutions to solve problems in their communities. Last summer, we had a group of kids who had a, a really novel idea. They found out through the Office of Emergency Management that they have cell phones that are really kind of just unused and untapped. And their idea was to, for high school students to get service learning hours, they would walk around the city with orange shirts on and call it orange phone. And they would provide those phones as opportunities for people that were housing insecure and homeless to use those sales phones to call a list of resources that they had provided there. In the room to judge that capstone project was then Stephanie, a young lady named Stephanie Coleman who was running for alderman of the 16th Ward. She ended up winning and she took these young people with her to the mayor's office to discuss this idea. So these are the kinds of ideas that we have kind of being birthed of young people who are our students and scholars out of Chicago Scholars. Other ideas were very cool ones in the apps around uh, food storage and getting food. You know, it was just amazing the number of ideas we had. When we presented the idea last year, when I presented it to the team who had to implement it, they did not want to do it. Our staff were younger and they thought this was going to be something that was going to be fly by night. And so when we actually decided to roll this out, they planned for 15 of the cohorts of kids to actually deliver the pitch. We have 40 cohorts of our 90 actually want to participate in this. So it proves that not only are our young people desiring to get more civically engaged and involved in the solution, they're actually showing up to do the work. And we saw that last year. This year, we're hoping to have 60 of our 90 cohorts to participate. Our impact, we have a 96% matriculation rate. So our kids do make it to the second year of school. 95% of our scholars persist to the second year, and 83% of our scholars graduate within six years. Now, why is that significant? When you look at the data of the same amount of kids, the same kids of the same economic quartile that come from CPS, the graduation rate's about 18%. So it's a huge difference that we're making in the lives of these young people through the supports we provide. My world, career and leadership, what, what do we do? Well, I always tell young people that College is great, right? It proves that you can learn. That's really what the degree that we have. It just proves that we have aptitude in a specific area. But it's more to it that's required to really maximize and enhance your leadership. So we work with the kids to identify their strengths. We use Gallup Strength Finder and Youth Science to actually put data behind this. And last year we used Hello Insight, a startup in High Park. We actually measured youth leadership in action. And what we saw was that in our scholars, they come in more higher asset in leadership compared to 60,000 other kids of their same age. Yet, when they do our program and they go through our program, the capacity growth that they see is 4x that of those same kids. So they come in higher and they leave even higher. And so the, the work that we're doing is really phenomenal. We have a solid uh, set of leadership qualities and competencies that we have that's based on Dr. Harry Kramer's values-based leadership model and the Yoso social and cultural capital model as well. And so we have really done a lot of research and have been intentional about the curriculum we've built so that kids get a holistic program. They grow their network. Through our program, they meet so many different people through networking opportunities and all the events we do. Of course, their mentor and counselor that they have as part of the work uh, and then as we built in the last year, and I'll talk about this next, we added an uh, internship program called Emerge, which is really at the core an eight to 10 week internship program. However, we take kids that work Monday through Thursdays and on Fridays, we take them all over the city to places like this, to CIBC, to the Cubs Stadium, to uh, numerous places where they actually get to meet senior leaders and organizations, senior civic leaders, and then they also get to experience and practice in, in vivo what happens in real life. In vitro what happens in vivo. That's my healthcare side. I used to sell in vitro fertilization medicine, so ask about that. That's hilarious. 
And then we hope them, you know, help them recognize their influence. You know, our goal is for them to be able to then take this and go and lead the organizations that, that we get them in and help them open the doors to. Last year, we worked with Facebook to create a program, a hackathon, a week-long program that we built in partnership with Leo Burnett and DePaul's College of Advertising. And so here's some of the pictures where the kids over the course of a week learned about careers in digital advertising. On that Wednesday, they went to Leo and met senior leaders from the company. And then on Friday, we were in the Facebook office. And Facebook has a, a program where they teach the young people their mobile studio. Uh, their leaders came in and taught kids how to build ads for two small businesses in the city. And the kids built the ads. And what the kids don't know is that the ads have been running the last year that they built. Uh, this summer, when we do it again, the, two, the winning groups will be brought back and they'll be given laptops. So just trying to figure out ways to scale impact as much as possible. Our Emerge program, as I mentioned, is our, our Career and Leadership Development Internship Program. This program gives students a paid opportunity to really practice uh, those skill sets so that when they get into the working world, they're ready, prepared, and able to be successful. The program is uh, pretty rigorous. So I mentioned earlier that 1,000 kids apply to be part of Chicago Scholars, and then again, these kids have to apply again at the end of their freshman year of college to be part of this program. And so what we do is try to find our top performers. We split this program out into five cohorts, a STEM cohort, which is mostly our tech kids. We have a business cohort, a healthcare cohort, a civic government and law cohort kind of combined. So we had kids work at uh, Cook County Assessor's office, at Tammy Duckworth's office, and at Valencia's office, Kirkland and Ellis, Winston Strong. Um, and then we also had a, a social impact cohort, which was all of our nonprofit partners. Um, we actually had some funding, so we were able to cover the cost of the internship placement, the, the summer stipend for the student, for those nonprofit partners. The other companies had to pay. So it's just some of our career partner list since 2018. Uh, in year one, we placed 20 kids at 13 companies. In year two, we placed 80 kids at 54 companies, and this year, We'll place 100 to 125 kids at 75 companies. Uh, we're already at 60, so we're, we're trailing towards that number, but we need more. So if your company or anyone in the room has a firm that may want to be part of this, please speak to me. We can use more partners. We have a lot of kids, about 35% that are interested in tech. And that is the one field, the one area where if you look up here, not a lot of tech companies. Uh, we need to get better at that. And that's not a knock to them. I think it's more of a function of who our board of directors has been comprised of historically. We got a lot of lawyers and a lot of finance people on our board. And so those relationships have opened the door here. I mentioned the growth labs on Friday, which are those professional development sessions. And there are some challenges we're facing. So this is where, you know, as I look towards connecting with each of you in the room and partnering with you, we've got really three. I've listed two. As you think and you use your brains. How do we scale this program to serve all 1,150 of our rising sophomores and juniors? What, it, what tech exists already, whether it's learning management systems that do this well, we have a gap in that knowledge base inside of our organization. And then how do we rethink growth labs to support not just all of our scholars that are in the internships, but that content's really valuable. And is there a world where we can create that content and deliver it with a platform to support all 4,000 of our scholars? The third is as we think about the scholar portal, if you have expertise in that area, what gaps? What don't we see? What are we missing? And so if you all want to connect with me, have ideas and insights on that, we actually have an upcoming focus group where we're bringing technology leaders in, and we'll have conversations about how to do this better. How can we do this better? Um, we believe that it, people over everything really matters, and we're doing as much as we can to support our scholars. But the only way we do that is through partnerships with organizations like Shy Hack Night and many of the, the ones you guys represent in this room. So, I'll stop there and uh, answer any questions, but thank you for allowing me to present what we do. Um, and again, thank you for having me tonight. This is just an inc incredible level of impact, both in absolute terms and relative terms. I'm curious what um, the, can you detail a little bit the programming uh, in regards to the growth labs? Like, um, can, you, can you give a? a sure, a yeah, thank you. So the growth labs are part of the internship program, the Emerge program on those Fridays. And they're really built to enhance and develop skills and those the leadership competencies that we I didn't go through those. And it'd probably be good to list those in the actual document. But uh, growth mindset and grit, communication and collaboration, innovation, decision making, teamwork, uh, and professionalism. No, accountability. Not, no, we got rid of professionalism. Accountability. Uh, we've actually been on this D&I diversity and inclusion journey inside of our organization. 
and it's helped us reshape and rethink a lot of what we did, we've done. I actually want to commend Shai Hacknight because even in the way you all have done your code of conduct, uh, it's practicing inclusive leadership and consideration of people and how they present and how they can report things that may, may be difficult to do at times. And so even for us, we're rolling diversity and inclusion into our work as well and bringing experts in to help with that. A lot of the funding from the actual MBA will go towards to expanding that work and even getting deeper in that work on helping our scholars recognize that identity and representation matters and how can they bring that in their whole selves into our program but into the organizations they're going to work for. So uh, the growth labs go deep into that and we bring experts in from the community who sometimes are volunteers, sometimes they're paid to really work in those spaces. But one of the things we did last year was financial literacy. A lot of our kids know bank account, checking account credit. They wanted to know how do you invest. Um, another thing we did last summer, we brought in an organization called Calm Classroom who teaches med meditation and yoga practices. We recognize a lot of our students are dealing with stress and anxiety, being academic high performers. Um, and we wanted to give them some tools to recognize how they can deal with that. And so what we do is really partner to deliver content that makes the most sense for our young people. And we practice design thinking, so it's not us telling them what they need. They've told us these are the things that they need. Congratulations to you on the, uh, your growth over the last 20 years. Um, since you have been doing this for so long, do, and you've that's got alumni for 20-some years, do you have a database of your alumni, and have you been able to do any research showing uh, where they are now 5, 10, 15 years afterwards, and how many of them are engaged in some form of mentoring either with you or with somebody else uh, where they are now? That's an excellent question. So this is the first year that we have a comprehensive alumni destination survey that went out. Um, so far, we've gotten results back. So we have about 1,000 alumni that are currently in the city from the last 20 years. And you guys are probably like numbers. How are you serving 4,000 now and it's only 1,000 alumni? For the first 15 years of the program, we took 50 kids a year. Uh, since in the last seven years, we went to 100, 100, 210, 400, 5, 675, 750, 750, the next couple. And so that means that as we've scaled, the number of alumni that are graduating will scale. That number will keep growing over the next few years. But we're excited to be, we're starting to pull that data now. Anecdotally, I know that we have, out of our 270 mentors, 25 of them are current uh, mentors in the program that have come back. Ten, nine of our staff members are current alumni. Two board members are alumni. So we're starting to see what we hope to happen um, is it, starting to show up. Last year, two of the uh, Forbes 20 in their 20s were Chicago scholars. Uh, one of the 30 in the 30s were Cranes. 20 in their 20s was a Chicago scholar. So we're starting to, you know, feel our impact as we see it scale. A um, few people that have run for office, not successfully, but we have a couple of alum that have run for office in the last year and a half. Um, and so we've, we're seeing some of the things we want to see. But this survey that uh, we're compiling now will be the first time we'll actually have firm data on what that looks like. Along with that, while um, the alumni data, also the career data. This is the first time where we're actually looking at career data. So where are they working? Where did they work outside of the first six months graduation? Where are they working now? Did they stay at the jobs that they had within the first two years? We think that data is going to be really compelling for companies who we know are struggling to keep millennial and zennial talent in their, their doors. And so then the next phase is that it's going back and starting to do research on why. I think we have some opportunities there to maybe draft a white paper to share with organizations to say this is why students leave that are the, of this, uh, this talent that you're looking for and this is why they stay. Um, and so that's the kind of framing of where the work is headed next. Part of the funding, again, from the NBA is going to go to that work, too. I'm just curious, due to your success in Chicago, are you seeing similar programs pop up elsewhere that have just simply been inspired by your work? Yeah, so we've been looking for other programs. It's actually part of it, like, to learn from and grow with. There's a program in Atlanta that does very similar work all the way through the process. Um, in Chicago, there's an Evanston Scholars, which is a program that actually was a spinoff of Chicago Scholars. There's other programs that do parts of this, right? Posse, um, Brave and Academy Group, excellent programs. None have really figured out or done the work to go through that seven year gap. I understand why. First, it's expensive and it's timely and it's hard to look at measured outcomes over that long period of time, which is why the numbers that I have are our graduation metrics. So those are the easiest. You do an NSC data pool. We can look at if scholars went and they graduated. We have that information. But now we're like, we have to see it through to the end. 
It's the one thing to graduate, but we know and we've seen just too many scholars come back and say, I got a computer engineering degree from Northwestern and I can't find a job. What, what's not happening? Where's the disconnect? Um, but we want to make sure that that's data informed and our CEO is very <laughs> adamant about making sure that that happens. And so, um, you know, we're looking for other programs who have tried to do this. We have not been able to find many uh, from the full scope from start to finish. Yeah, awesome work. Thanks for, for coming and sharing with us. Um, you talked a little bit about the importance of, to, to that point, to career coaching, post-college mentorship. Um, are you guys, have you guys started to work on that? And if so, what are you doing? And what's your vision for the long term? Because I think that that is really important. It is much more than just graduating college. It's the next 10 years after that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's always been the question of when do we, when do we end? Is there an end? We say once a scholar, always a scholar. But we have so many alumni scholars coming back that want, want more. Uh, we do have an alumni relations team now that reports to me. We also have an alumni leadership council. Um, the goal is to help the alumni build these supports so that it's sustainable. So they're driving and leading it. And so right now, actually, we're looking for someone to come in and speak on how to um, tackle imposter syndrome inside of the workplace. The scholars have told us that that's something they want to learn. And so we're bringing folks in. And, and I want to make sure that I mentioned Chicago Scholars isn't a program just for black and brown students. While that is the, uh, a large majority of our students, we have students of every race, every gender, every sexual orientation, every religion. It's not agnostic to one group, which I think also builds something very unique. When you walk into the room, when you see 45 to 50 of our alumni scholars, and they are diverse, you often don't get that kind of leadership capital in the city. This is actually one of the other rooms that I say where I actually see that. The only other room that I've been part of where I saw that often was like New Leaders Council, where it was de designed such that you had those kind of rooms and thought partnership to do this. Um, but that's something that we recognize that we have as a strategic advantage, and we need to figure out how to capitalize on it, where now we do have older alumni scholars. The oldest alumni scholars are, are the same age as me. They're 39, uh, helping and giving back to our younger scholars. One of our alumni scholars built a program at Rush Hospital, uh, a Rush Public Advisory Council where students um, are actually looking at public health issues in their community. They write uh, blogs about them, and they're sharing them with leadership at Rush so that Rush can now, as they embark on strategic planning, think about where they can put resources in supporting some of the initiatives that the students are telling them that they see. That was a scholar-led initiative working with the doctor at Rush who actually funded this program that is all comprised of Chicago scholars from 15 different neighborhoods. And so those are the kind of unique partnerships that we're building with organizations that I think are the way to accomplish some of what you've spoken of uh, without us having to fund programming for 20 years because um, we've run out of money. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, uh, what are your requirements for your partners who accept insurance from your program? Do you have any? <laughs> yes, good, good question, yes. So it's interesting you ask that because we're thinking about a, um, I'm writing now the corporate partner strategy. Um, historically, it's been partners have to apply. And so we look at every application one by one of who's going to be there to manage the scholar, what kind of supports will be provided, what will be the work function, what are some of the initiatives you have going on inside of your organization from a DNI perspective. Companies have been, some have been hesitant to give that information, as you could imagine. Um, but you know, we've asked that if you want to partner with us, it's in partnership and good faith that you're providing that. We're not doing this to be punitive. We actually do it to learn. And so we've got World Business Chicago and Andy's Ops team also helping us with that as well and how and thinking about how we review and look at organizations. The thing that another challenge we have and I'm faced with now is how do you measure the success and impact of that partnership for a student? We can survey the student. We can survey the company. I think those are, are one way, but what real data what can we dive into? What can we look at? So um, work with Thrive on trying to partner and get data from Gallup to see if there's Gallup data out there from employees internally to certain organizations that exist. And then the idea, so in the college phase, we use fit and match as an algorithm that was developed by the University of Chicago and how we place scholars. It takes different things into account, like your financial situation, your major, how far do you want to go from home, and some social and emotional things as well to look at the proper fit and match for a college. We're working to build the same thing for companies, but we're trying to figure out what data and what metrics do we use to ascribe a fit and match algorithm for companies. So all of that's part of the next phase of work, which is why 
the first thing that we had to do as an organization was dive in to diversity and inclusion ourselves to understand that we didn't have it figured out. So we brought in outside consultants and they're doing an assessment of our entire programming, our hiring practices, our board is going through training, our associate board, everyone involved, our career partners. Um, and from there, we'll then be able to use that as this is the rubric that we, we believe, based on data and research, really matters to our scholars and organization. And from there, we can build out this algorithm of, and when I say it's, it's actually a system, kids log in and they put in what all of the data that they're asked and it returns values to them of these are the schools that are great, platinum partner, high five, ones that may not be so great, um, and then they're able to apply from there. We want to do the same thing from a corporate company perspective. Uh, I had a question about the, uh, so the scholars, you talked a little bit about their financial literacy. Mm -hmm. um, do you help them like with scholarship applications or loan applications um, and then just like helping them navigate that? Is that something they need? Is that something you do? Yeah. Uh, and then the second question also about money was just like, but just about your organization, how are you primarily funded? Mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of efforts do you do to raise funds? Thank you. Yeah. The first question. Yeah, we do. So the first 15 years that I mentioned when it was 50 students a year, we actually would give students $1,000 a year as part of the program. So each student would get 1000 a year over the course of four years. They had to maintain a GPA. Um, we saw that with that, while the money was helpful, it wasn't the most critical thing, not at the $1,000 level, to get them through. So we started working directly with the colleges. We have 50 schools that are platinum partner schools that will actually backfill any unmet merit need for any of our kids if they're in our program. So in Georgetown, Grinnell, um, uh, Paloma, some really solid schools that will do that. And so when schools, students apply in that fit and match algorithm, they apply to four schools who may one stretch, one reach school, uh, one school that's a safety school, uh, one of the platinum partner schools, and two other schools that are right in alignment with where they should fit. That way we have a, a catch-all and a safety school that we know they'll get into and get funding. We have a platinum partner school that will, if money is the issue, will backfill that merit need for them, and then a reach school that should be a school in a higher you know, category that they can get into. So we do help them with loan applications with the FOSFA. Uh, we also help them with scholarship applications. We have a scholarship fair as well. And we also not just work with the students, we actually bring the parents in, and we sit with the parents and the guardians to help them understand. A lot of our students, um, being first gen parents, don't know what a Parent PLUS loan is. They don't understand the FOSFA why do they have to give their taxes? Some parents actually don't want to do that. So we work with the parents to understand why those things are valuable and critical to the success of the student and get them comfortable with it as well. Um, we also have to do sometimes some social emotional development with parents who don't want their kid to go far away. But if your kid gets into Harvard, that's the, that might be the best outcome to change the trajectory of their life. And so we work with parents. We have a period engagement team that specializes in that. Second to that, our funding is mostly foundation and individual donors. Um, our corporate giving is starting to increase now, uh, but that's newer as corporations are starting to see the talent pipeline we provide is valuable. And so we do have some really good partnerships we've had recently, some big wins with Bank of America, uh, big construction, Walsh construction. The mayor uh, recently announced a partnership with Walsh Flower, um, the CTA and Chicago Scholars, where they're funding scholarships for students interested in STEM. Uh, and those students will also work in partnership for the new red and purple line developments over the next few summers. And so those are some of the other unique things we're pulling together and how we can work with the community and the government uh, to actually fund some of the things and initiatives that may make sense for our kids and for the community. All right, not seeing any more hands. We are right about at time as well. So thank you, Jeff, for coming and talking to us. <laughs>